This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 56, Amba, Part 1. Last episode was mostly a reassessment of the cast of players who will be fighting it out in the coming war. Bhishma kindly reminded us of who all these guys were, and gave us a sense of their individual prowess on the battlefield. I must confess that there are many more names in Bhishma's list than what I gave you. I'm trying my best to keep the number of names and peripheral characters to a minimum. To the best of my knowledge, all the guys I left out will not contribute anything meaningful in the coming drama. I suspect many of them were included as a memorial to venerable ancestors, whom some later king saw fit to place at the side of the Kurus in the greatest battle of all history. Our translator even speculates that one Parava, on the Karava side, who is praised by Bhishma as a great fighter, is the very same Poros, whom the Greeks recall as the Indian warrior who turned back Alexander at the Indus River. India had nearly forgotten this obscure hero, who had saved her from the trauma of a second Aryan invasion. But perhaps she preserved his name as a bit player in her national epic. As for the rest of the unmentioned kings and ratas, I don't think you'll miss them. I was checking the Ganguli version of the epic, and in that version, Bhishma uses three kinds of ratas. Rata, Ati Rata, and Maharata. Since he does not define any of these terms, it is difficult to know for sure what he meant by Maharata, which translates roughly as a great chariot warrior. Although some folks like to believe that Atirata and Maharata are roughly equivalent, I tend to think it is more like a Rata. For instance, in Ganguli's version, Bhishma ranks the four non-Arjun Pandavas as all Maharatas, while in the critical edition, they have them as simply Ratas. I take this to mean that Maharata is sort of an honorary title, because obviously the Pandavas could not be in the same class of warrior as someone like Shakuni. In any case, if you search the internet, you'll find plenty of people obsessed with the fighting skills of these various heroes. It really doesn't interest me very much, so we'll leave it at that. At the end of Bhishma's muster of the 18 armies, he assured his nephew that he was perfectly capable of destroying all their enemies single-handedly if necessary. But there were two groups of fighters that he refused to kill. Those were the five Pandavas, and any women or anyone who had once been a woman. In this latter category fell only one person, King Drupad's transsexual son, Sikandin. Of course, everybody wanted to hear about that, so Duryodhana asked him to explain what the deal was with this one obscure fighter. Bhishma began to tell the story, beginning back in the days when his own father, Shantanu, was still king. He mentioned his promise not to marry, and then how he had placed his brother, Chitrangada, on the throne. And after he died, his second brother, Vichitravirya, was made king. He's too polite to say what his younger brother's defects were, but he most certainly had some kind of problem, because Bhishma felt obliged to steal him some wives. The women were the three princesses of Kashi, modern-day Varanasi Banaras. They were called Amba, Ambika, and Ambalika. Their father had put on an extravagant swamvar, and all the heroes and kings of India showed up, for each girl to choose her own husband. As we've been told elsewhere in the book, Swamvar is okay for a Kshatriya, but the very best way to find a wife is to steal her. I guess Vichy Treveria's chances of getting chosen were obvious, because they didn't even try. Instead, Bhishma crashed the Swamvar in his chariot, kidnapped the three princesses, fought off the cream of the Kshatriya caste, and brought them back to marry his brother. With his stepmother Satyavati's consent, the wedding date was set. Some time later, the eldest Kashi girl, Amba, petitioned to Bhishma, saying that she could not go forward with the marriage. She confessed that she had been planning on choosing the king of Shalva for her husband, until Bhishma smashed in and grabbed her. Even more, she had already made an agreement with Shalva, and they had already betrothed in their hearts. Of course, her father knew nothing about this. Probably thinking that two wives were more than enough for the defective king, Bhishma and Satyavati consented to let the girl go. They provided her with an armed escort, and she and her nurse went straight to Shalva. The king was shocked to see her at his doorstep, but he tried to pretend he was happy to see her. Excitedly, she told him how she had been set free, and now they were finally free to be together forever and ever. King Shalva put on a fake smile and said, I'm really happy for you, but you can't stay here. Perhaps you'll go back to your father? I must say that the best thing would be for you to go back to Hastinapur. They're good people over there. Hopefully they'll take you back. Finally, he noticed how utterly crushed she looked when she found that he would not take her back. The king tried to explain himself. He said, 
I'm sorry, but we just can't be together anymore. Once Bhishma ran off with you, you were damaged goods in the eyes of the world. I have a kingdom to run here, and it is full of moralistic Brahmins and self-righteous nobles. They would never allow me to marry a woman who belonged to another man. I must set a good example for all my people, and marrying you would be just the opposite of that. So move along now, and don't let the door hit you on the way out. Ambo was shocked, dejected, and could feel that dangerous female rage boiling up. She said, no, 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 don't talk like that. Do you think I wanted to be abducted? You thought I was having fun? Do not abandon the one who loves you. I already discussed this with Bhishma, who's wise in the Dharma. And he says there's no scandal in this whatsoever. I swear to you that I never loved anyone but you. I was never with those other men. I see no man but you. The king said, So, you had a real nice talk with Bhishma, eh? He's so wise. Why did you go to him? Maybe he'll take you. Do what you want. Now go. You belong to Bhishma now. Shrieking and wailing, Ambo was escorted from the building. Half delirious, and not even sure where she was going, she left the city. Bitterly, she went over the recent events in her mind, trying to figure out what had gone wrong and whom she should blame. She cursed God, cursed her father, cursed Shalva and Bhishma, and she cursed herself for not acting sooner and jumping off of Bhishma's chariot when she was first taken. With her mind going endlessly in circles, she finally settled on the main cause of all her sorrows. It was Bhishma who had destroyed all her dreams and had perverted her fate from the life of a happy queen of Shalva to this situation, where she had no protector, her reputation was destroyed, and she had nowhere to turn. Bhishma had turned her life upside down, and she dedicated her existence to getting revenge on him. She said, Bhishma Shantanava is the cause of all my misfortunes, and I see now that I have to get revenge on him. Her problem was that all the other kings were afraid of him, and her honor had been compromised, so there was little hope of finding her a champion. Since her only hope was to help herself, she sought shelter with some ascetics living in the forest. The leader of this group, a Brahmin named Saikavatya, questioned her. She explained all that had happened to her and told them that she intended to become an ascetic and to develop her spiritual powers. The wise sage had sympathy for her and said he'd do what he could to help. But behind the scenes, the sadhus were all worried about having a nubile princess living among them. Finally, they concluded that they could not keep her. They encouraged her to go to her father. They said, Bless you, but you really should go home to your father. He will know what's best to do. For women must turn to their husbands when they need anything, and when they have a serious problem, they must go to their father. Asceticism is no walk in the park, dear girl, especially for a delicate princess like yourself. Amba was adamant, however. She did not think her father would be so forgiving. And besides, she wanted to make sure that her next life was better than the present one. And she would do that by fasting, yoga, and prayer. Luckily for Amba, while they were negotiating her next move, a passing sadhu took notice. It was her maternal grandfather, a noble kshatriya, who had at some point left his worldly position and become an ascetic. This saint was very sympathetic with his granddaughter, and he came up with an idea. He said, Do not go back to your father. I've got a better idea. Go to see Rama Jamadagnya. Tell him I sent you, and he'll take care of everything. He will surely kill Bhishma and make things all better. There must have been a sadhu convention going on, because just then, Rama's good friend, Akritavrana, was passing by, and Amba's grandfather waved him over. Once again, she repeated the story to him, and he said, Rama is my friend, and he will carry out your request. But first, you need to figure out what it is you want. Would you rather fix things up with Shalva or get revenge on Bhishma? Well, you know what they say about a woman scorned. She preferred revenge over marriage. Possibly, at a Kritravana summons, Rama himself appeared. Keep in mind that this is the Ram I've been calling Parashurama, and not the Rama of the Ramayana. The girl made one more appeal, directly to the famous Brahmin, and he said, I very much would like to help you but I only take up arms on behalf of Brahmins. But just say the word and I will compel Bhishma or Shalva to do whatever you want. The girl did not want that, however. She wanted revenge. Rama tried to deter her, but she stuck to her guns. She said, If you want to help me, then figure out a way to kill Bhishma, because that's all I want. Rama was still not sure about this mission, but Akrit of Rana interceded with his friend. He said, Look, Bhishma isn't dumb. Just do what the girl asks, and I'm sure Bhishma will immediately concede defeat and do whatever you tell him. I'm sure it'll be just fine. 
So Rama agreed to do it, and he left for Kurukshetra with his Brahmin friends, Amba, and a crowd of spectators. Rama and his followers set up camp at the famous battlefield and then sent a challenge to Bhishma. Bhishma said he went happily to greet this ancient and venerable Bhirgu. He hurried to the field of the Kurus with his own band of Brahmins in tow, and after respectfully greeting the immortal hero, he discovered what Rama was up to. Rama scolded Bhishma, saying, Why on earth did you choose to ruin this girl? First you abducted her, and then you let her go again, and now she's unmarriageable by anyone. Because you took her, Shalva cannot marry her, nor can anyone else. Therefore, I order you to take her back. It is unlike you to treat someone this shabbily. The problem, of course, was that the Kurus now had the same problem as Shalva. The girl had been off wandering the roads of India without supervision, so who would want such questionable reputation in their queen? What if she turned up pregnant? She was damaged goods, and Vichy Treviria could never take her back. Bhishma said, Reverend sir, there is no way I can take her back to my brother. She told me she was Shalva's betrothed, so I let her go. She went to the city of Salba, and I don't know what she's been up to since. The Dharma of Kings demands that their women be free of even the hint of scandal, and I am sworn to uphold that. I can do nothing less. Bhishma said that at that point, Rama got really angry, his face getting red and his eyes rolling. This was a dangerous sign from the guy who exterminated the race of Kshatriyas many times over, just because one of them stole his father's cow. This debate is interesting because not only was Rama a living saint, he had also been Bhishma's guru in the martial arts. In Hindu tradition, one's guru is to be treated like God's deputy on earth. They are to be honored and obeyed without question. To justify himself, Bhishma had to argue himself out of a tough spot. Bhishma countered, You are my guru, and I have always honored you greatly, but now you're not acting like a guru. Of course, it is a sin to kill one's guru, let alone killing a Brahmin and an ascetic. I bear you no grudge, but Dharma allows for this. Acting in self-defense, even against a Brahmin, is no sin. So if you insist on making my brother marry this woman, I will fight you, and I may kill you. I am not afraid to die. I have often heard you bragging about how you killed off all the Kshatriyas long ago, but back then there was no Bhishma Shantanava. This time I am here, and you are old, and I will take away your pride in war. Rama was delighted. He laughed and said, I am glad you choose to fight it out. Let's do it, but be sure to bring your mommy along. I want the Lady of the Ganges to be here to see you dead on a pile of my arrows. I think these latter comments should be taken as the usual hearty banter that precedes a fight, so the warriors can display their fearlessness in the face of battle. Bhishma says he then returned home and suited up for battle. He prepared his weapons and dressed all in white, and rode back to Kurukshetra ready for a fight. He does not explain the reason for wearing all white, so my guess is that it was the color of mourning, so he's putting on mourning in anticipation of the death of his guru. When Bhishma arrived at the field of battle, he gave a few loud blows on his conch. His mother, the river goddess Ganga, heard the sound and appeared between the two opponents. In addition, the sound of his horn reached the heavenly realms, and flocks of rishis and gods flew down to watch the action. Ganga went to her son and scolded him. She said, Have you lost your mind? Do you really intend to fight with the Kshatriya slayer himself? Besides, you are his student. Bhishma saluted his mother, but was not deterred. He explained to his mother what had sparked the conflict, and she decided to try negotiating with the Bhargava Rama. This too failed, and Rama proceeded to challenge his opponent to a duel. Bhishma said, Mount your chariot, otherwise this will not be a fair fight. The Brahmin gallantly replied, The earth is my chariot, and the Vedas are my four steeds. Just as the words left his mouth, he let loose a dense rain of arrows against Bhishma. Bhishma recalled, Thereupon I saw Rama standing in a celestial chariot, carrying all manner of weaponry. It had been manifested from his mental power and was as large as a city. His friend, a Kritavrana, became his driver. Rama yelled, Attack! And the two chariots began rumbling inexorably toward each other. They were racing at each other at full speed when... At about the distance of three arrow shots, Bhishma suddenly hit the brakes, stopped his car, jumped out, and knelt in obeisance to his guru, as was proper. Saluting Rama, he said, I shall fight with you, my better and superior, my guru. Wish me victory, my lord. Rama was satisfied with this show of respect. He said, You have done well. I would have cursed you had you done any less. I will not wish you victory, however, because I am about to whoop your ass. 
Now go and fight. Bhishma again blew his conch, and the fight began in earnest. Bhishma was the first to be checked, as arrows struck his horses and driver, but they were uninjured. As the battle escalated, one of Bhishma's arrows struck Rama deep, knocking him back. The sight of his guru, struck by his own arrow, overwhelmed Bhishma. He said, I curse the way of the Kshatriyas. I have done an evil thing by following the rules of a warrior. The exchange went on like this for days, with the damage to each side becoming increasingly more bloody. At one point, Bhishma was knocked unconscious and had to be driven off the field. Soon after he recovered, one of Bhishma's arrows entered Rama's chest, throwing him to the ground. The audience of ascetics and priests all wailed as they saw him go down, and Amba ran out to revive him. They splashed cold water on him, and he blearily stood up, yelling, You're a dead man, Gangea! As soon as he recovered his wits, the fighting commenced and even escalated to the point where the vast number of arrows passing each other in the air caused friction fires in the sky, burning up the shafts in mid-flight. The next day, Rama began to get annoyed. He pulled out one of his weapons of mass destruction. Bhishma disarmed the first missile and deflected many others, causing nuclear blasts on either side of the battlefield. On the next day, Bhishma's charioteer, his friend and confidant, was killed by a dozen of Rama's arrows. Bhishma was upset and firing wildly, and Rama took a slow aim and fired a single arrow that struck Bhishma in the collarbone, shattering the bone and causing him to spit up blood. With a look of mild surprise on his face, Bhishma fell, his soul lifting out of his body. Rama watched this and roared exultantly, improvising a primitive sort of victory dance. Bhishma recalled that while Rama was celebrating, he had drifted up out of his body and found himself surrounded by eight luminous Brahmins, each as bright as the sun. He said that he just drifted with them peacefully, feeling as if they were his own dear brothers. Soon, however, they spoke to him, saying mysteriously, Have no fear, and may you fare well. In an instant, he woke up, back in his body. He stood and saw his mother, in his chariot, holding the horses. She had held his position while he had been dead. Bhishma bowed again to his mother and took back the reins, and the fighting resumed. As you might expect, it was now Bhishma's turn to reciprocate. This time it was Rama who was fatally wounded, and who had a near-death experience. We don't know his soul's adventures, but in the physical realm, the sky went completely dark. There were meteors, hurricanes, and earthquakes. Rama also soon recovered, and the next day the fighting resumed. The following night, Bhishma went to bed completely dejected. It seemed that neither of them could die, and neither could win. It was a horrific, endless stalemate. As he prepared to sleep, Bhishma prayed to be shown a way out, even if it meant his own death. That night, while he dreamt, the same eight Brahmins came to visit. Again, they said, Have no fear. Arise and fear not, Gangeya. You are in no danger. We are protecting you because you are our body. Rama Jamadagnya will never defeat you, but you will beat him. These spirit brothers, possibly the Vasus, then explained that Bhishma had learned some useful tricks in his past life, and if he just called upon that knowledge, it would come back to him. One of the things he'd forgotten was the spell for making a sleeper missile. This was knowledge from another plane of existence, and even Rama did not know about it. The spirit brother concluded, So call that spell to mind and use it with gusto. This won't kill Rama, so you will incur no guilt. Once he is struck, he will fall deeply asleep, which is as good as dead when it comes to fighting. Rama can't die anyway, so this is the karma-free solution. Bhishma awoke the next morning feeling optimistic, but had completely forgotten the night's dream. I guess Rama's dreams were more about retirement than victory, because he awoke in a bad mood. He began right off with atomic weapons and kept increasing the megatonnage with each volley. Bhishma countered with his atomic missile defense system and the resulting atmospheric explosions burned up everything for miles around. The force of these explosions crossed over into the neighboring dimensions and rattled the China and Devaloka while the netherworlds of the Yakshas and Rakshasas experienced cave-ins and landslides. Finally, Rama pulled out his Brahma weapon, the super H-bomb of the time and Bhishma countered by arming one of his own Brahmas. At that moment, with the multiverse poised for destruction, Bhishma remembered that dream. He dropped the Brahma weapon and manifested the sleeper missile. He quickly took aim, but before he could fire, the sage Narada called for a timeout. 
He said to Bhishma, Put down the sleeper. The gods are ordering you to desist. Just look at what you're about to do. That guy's a living saint. He's the best of the Brahmins, and he's your guru. Then Bhishma saw his spirit brothers again. They said, Do what Narada said. That will be for the best. Bhishma disarmed the sleeper and put it away. Rama saw this and threw a tantrum. He cursed and spat and said, I can't believe this. I've been beaten by that Kshatriya. But then Rama's dead ancestors appeared before him, and they tried to reason with him. They said, You need to stop doing this, picking fights with Kshatriyas. It's time you acted your age. Yes, it's true that we asked you to take up arms, and you really gave it to them good. But the times are changing. Let this fight be your last. Now let it go. Put down your weapons and get back to austerities and worship. They continued, Bhishma is one of the Vasus, and they've been protecting him all this time. You actually got off pretty lightly. But most of all, you need to give this up, because we know who shall kill Bhishma, and it won't be you. No, it will be the son of Indra, and reincarnation of Nara Prajapati, the primeval god. Rama was having none of it. He said, I've sworn never to withdraw, and I won't do it. I won't. Bhishma stood his ground, arrow notched and at the ready, while the ghosts pleaded with their son. Finally, the spirits again went to Bhishma and said, Go now to your guru and pay your respects. Bhishma gladly did as he was told and knelt before his teacher. Seeing this, his old affection returned to Rama. He smiled and said, There is no one like you on this earth, Bhishma. Go now. I am greatly gratified with your performance. Rama next summoned his ward, the Princess Amba. He said, Young woman, you could clearly see that I gave it my best shot, but I just couldn't beat that guy. I'm afraid I can't help you. I don't think you will ever get your wish, so I suggest you go to him and work something out. He is an honorable man, after all. Amba replied, Blessed Lord, it is just as you say. He is as honorable as he is invincible. But there's no way I will ever go back to that man. Instead, I'm going to figure out a way to bring him down myself. I'm going to end it for now. It's quite a story and there's lots more to come. For instance, Amba will continue to search for a solution to her problem and will finally look to her next life where she might reincarnate as a warrior. Instead, she's reborn as a girl. So her troubles are still far from over. We'll get all the details next time. Thanks for listening. <laughs>